This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a special return guest to the podcast. He is the one and only Phil Robertson. So he is a professional hunter, businessman, and reality TV star. He is the patriarch of the great American family, the Robertsons. He is also the founder of the company Duck Commander, and he is featured prominently on one of the biggest reality TV shows of all time, Duck Dynasty. He's also authored a bunch of books, a bunch of bestsellers like Happy, 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 The Theft of America's Soul, Jesus Politics, and then his book Uncanceled, which is what he talked about the last time he was on this. But the big reason why we have him back on the show is because there is a brand new movie out right now. So if you're listening to this on time, it is out right now, as in today. It's out today called The Blind. So this is a movie about his life. It's not a documentary. It's like a full feature length film a, about his life and the things that he experienced growing up. But the thing about this movie is I'm so thankful to his team for sending me an advanced screener so that I could watch it, um, is the movie itself is really, really rough. And I don't mean like the, the, the acting or anything like that. Like it covers the roughest parts of Phil Robertson's life. Because if you know anything about Phil Robertson, he wasn't a Christian his entire life. He, for big parts of his life was a horrible husband, a horrible guy in general, certainly a terrible father. And this movie kind of sits in that time period of his life when he was being horrible at all these things. And it kind of details how he find how he found Christ or how Christ found him, however you want to describe it. And it really gets into the nitty gritty. The thing about it is this is a faith-based film, I guess you could call it that, but it doesn't feel like one. And by that, I mean, it's actually good. The acting is really actually pretty good. The storyline is really gritty. It isn't one of those movies where it's like, it's a little bit edgy, but it's all about this kind of weird thing on the back end and kind of this weird, goofy ending. It's very, very raw. It's it's family appropriate, but it is raw and it's really, really rough. And so I actually had the opportunity uh, about a month ago, whenever I was down in Louisiana to film for their show, Unashamed, we did a couple of episodes for their show. And then Phil just hung around the studio afterwards and he and I just sat down and had a chat. And so we, we turned it into an interview. And so what you'll notice about this interview today is we don't talk about the blind like, you know, you would talk during a marketing interview. So what was it like, you know, being a part of this? And what about the script? And what about this and that? Every time I think I'm going to have a certain type of conversation with Phil Robertson, it goes completely a different way, whether I'm recording it or not. And so I just lose all expectations and I just flow. I walked into this uh, time period with him with no questions prepared. I don't even know if I had like a notepad down in, in case I got an idea to, to write it down. So this is kind of a free flowing conversation. You'll even notice towards the end, you, you kind of feel like it's wrapping up and then we kind of ramp up again before we actually close it out. But I just feel absolutely tickled to death to be Phil Robertson's friend, to have him, you know, tell me some of the things that he's told me in private, just about, you know, his ministry and my ministry and how they connect and just the entire Robertson family, uh, whatever they seem like on television they're they're the same way in person they're some of the nicest most down home people that you could ever meet uh you know al robertson hosted me at his house while i was out there uh you know earlier this summer and it's just always great to spend some time with, with those folks and uh, it's something that i look forward to every summer going down there and spending a little time with them so i'm so happy to bring the second interview with phil robertson to you so without further ado let's get into it so phil normally i would say Welcome back to Undone the Life of Man's podcast, but it doesn't seem super appropriate because I'm sitting in your studio, in your like duck shop and all that. So what should I say here at the very beginning? Well, uh, we just need to remember that all of us are sinners and, uh, and one day we're all going to die physically. Yeah. So when we read this material, thousands of years of ago the old testament starting with genesis there come a time when jesus will crush satan mm. and 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 everybody says when's that going to be so matthew starting from the first sentences in the bible the whole old testament is saying to us all Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. When you get to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're jumped off with Malachi. God hadn't said a word in 400 years. And all of a sudden, people look up and say, whoa, who is that? 
to get him here, Jesus is coming. Then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is here. Right. He's here. The kingdom is near. He brought that with him. And so we read, after Jesus is here, we say, who was he? So we read the verses from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All of them say the same thing. Jesus came to die, to be buried, and raised from the dead. All of them say the same thing. So if you want to find out about Jesus, just read the last two pages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you got him, you got him, and there he is. When he is saying, when the Apostle Paul is talking about what, what happened to him, here's what he said. I thank Christ Jesus, this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me, he came, now the Apostle Paul, during the time Jesus is here. But that's a prelude going into the Apostle Paul, just one man's life. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful. He was going around having people stoned to death for their belief. And he stood there and watched the whole thing, men, women, and children. This was one bad dude, mm. the Apostle Paul, Saul. I, I'm, I, he said, he's given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though when some of you say, I don't know, I mean, I've, I, my life is in shambles, I'm not worth, that's what he's saying. He wasn't worth it either. Even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor, killing men, women, and children, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, the one he had been getting up and persecuting with everybody he saw and having people killed. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So here's the worst sinner who wrote most of the New Testament, right. and his background was horrendous. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, I ran around for 28 years saying, I've got to be the worst no good, no count person. I was singing the blues that the Apostle Paul was. And when I read what, what the Apostle Paul was guilty of, it's amazing. But I said, Whew, boy, the 28 years that I wasted on the front end of this, how could somebody love me, a sorry, low-down heathen like myself? It helped me to see that the one who wrote most of the New Testament was in the same shape I was in. Well, and that's, <clears throat> Phil, that's got to be comforting because, you know, part of the reason why we're talking today is because of, about the movie The Blind. That That yep. is, uh, as of the list, you know, the release of this episode is going to be out for people to watch. And you mentioned to me at your house this morning, you know, you're, you're kind of a little bit embarrassed that, okay, here's this movie. It doesn't detail the, the rise of... A the, little you know, more, uh, more than a little bit. Yeah, but, but but this is what I would say. So, you know, you would think, okay, this is going to be a movie about, you know, the creation of this duck call empire. And that's that's not what it is. That's like a fraction of the movie. That's right. The movie is about you and Miss Kay and specifically you and your story to Christ. But the thing is, is the film does not ignore the really, really dark things that was happening in your life at those times. And so while I can understand how you would say, hey, that, that's embarrassing, the rawness and the realness and the authenticity of that message is what resonates because there are people, Phil, and you know this, you, you've done this and you've led a lot of people to Christ. They will think that their level of depravity is unique, that they've done stuff that Christ's blood couldn't possibly cover. And that that's probably the redeeming thing about watching the film. The, the film is fantastic. So if you like movies, yeah, cinematography is great. You know, the acting is fantastic. And, and the gal that played uh, Miss Kay as an adult was, was tremendous. Just she, she nails it. But 
talk to me a little bit more about the message that you wanted to get by? Because you are kind of laying yourself bare. I mean, it's not you in the movie, but it is your life that you're laying bare for the world to see and judge. If you went back 2,000 years, if you go back 2,000 years, a couple of texts, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. It's a movie about how obvious it becomes, Mm -hmm. the acts of the sinful nature. Sexual immorality, guilty as charged. Impurity, guilty as charged on my part. Debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, I don't think I ever got into that. (laughs) Hatred, there. Discord, yeah. Jealousy, a lot. Fits of rage, over and over. Selfish ambition, yeah. Dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness. Oh, my goodness. I've been commoded, I've been drunk so much. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I'm 28. That's my resume. Mm. And I'm, I'm like, good night. When I'm reading these texts, I said, Jesus. I said, it sounds too good to be true. Right. You mean all this can be blotted out? But it didn't know, I didn't know at the time, but the fruit of the Spirit that you receive when you are converted, you die to sin, you're buried in a pool of water, and up you come. Well, up from the grave he arose. <laughs> the fruit. It's obvious what the sinful nature is. Now when they run up on me, they see love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I didn't know that. So I, I started out by saying, from the guy who told me, showed me that, I said, good night of living. I, I think it's too good to be true. All my sins blotted out? Yeah. Guaranteed to be raised from the dead? Mm. Yeah, that's what you get. I'm like, it's free? Yeah. So when I came to Jesus, I was a humble man. And I've made it my goal to be that way when I run up on others. So now if you lined them up all the way down to the river, where I live right next to the river. When the backwater's up, I live in the river. But taking people out there, giving them that message and praying for them and taking them to the river and baptizing them. From the time I was 28, I'm now 77, and we still are at it. We still are at it. Same message, same Jesus, same response. We love them. We look for the the fruit of the Spirit coming forth from their lives. So now I went from a rank heathen to a follower of Jesus. And boy, is following Jesus a lot better than than living a sinful life. Is it far better? Well, let's actually talk about that because this is a half a century of being a disciple of Christ, not just being a Christian, because that's kind of a nebulous term that you can that's self-define, right. whatever, but you're a disciple of Christ. You're digging into the Word. That was the the comment I made about our first conversation on my show last year or whenever that was. Scripture just kind of comes out of you. It's like sweat. It just comes out of your pores. Like you don't even have to think about it. You just go from thing to thing. But, Phil, when some people have been Christians for a long time, they think it's like they lose the thread on what the gospel is. They, they get to this point where it's like, okay, yeah, you know, I, all I have to do is, is reach out and God's going to save me. And, you know, I, I make that decision and I'm going to repent and blah, blah, blah. But then the further they get away from that moment, that extreme moment, as is depicted yep. in, in the blind, they think they got to add to it, that there's something that they can do to make the gospel sweeter somehow. And so I guess guess for you the thing that I'm I'm so thankful for for you is you're in your sage stage but you have not turned the lights out because there are people that get to your age, your stage of, you know, in your fifth decade going into your sixth decade of serving Christ and they think God's done with me, it is what it is, but you're still pouring in to the younger generations whether that be 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, yeah. where I am. But how do you kind of keep sight 
of, hey, I don't have to do anything extra. The message is not complicated. The That's message right. is right here, and it's, right. it's that simple. I'm not a Bible scholar at all. Mm. I just have read enough in the Bible to see that finally there is relief and forgiveness. And knowing God is there, that he loves you. He'll get you out of here alive. I look at that and I say, man, the, 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 what you get out of it is everything. Everything. So just think about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If he didn't, there's no hope. There's no chance for us to do anything. Goodness, badness, that doesn't make any difference. So we live in a culture. Listen to this. This is a culture that's come on the scene. It is now a pile of rubble, the Roman Empire. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by, the, by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, it, my job is to make it plain to them the truth about God. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen. All you have to do is look. Being understood from what's been made so that men are without excuse. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. I've been there. The Roman Empire was there, by the way, too. Foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Just look at this system. A, a whole nation that's now a pile of rubble. You say, what happened to it? Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Same way the men abandoned natural relations with women. They were inflamed with the lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. There's a price to be paid to all nations. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, I did that for 28 years. He gave them over to a depraved mind. I've been there. To do what ought not to be done. I've been there. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And you see that in that movie they made. They tried to be like that, be like a me. But it's a movie to show people my, my sins. So when you think about it, senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. How in the world do you ever end up senseless, faithless, no God, heartless, ruthless, although they know God righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of them. Well, along comes the gospel in the middle of that worldwide. So my job is to love my neighbor, share with him, Jesus, him crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, reenact that through faith, repentance, and they're born again. And for everyone born again, my man, it's worth it. Last week, two, two did that. You say, are you baptizing them every week? Every week, right. somebody shows up. I re my job is to reach out to preach the gospel, love my neighbor. That's how I show I love him. So they can curse me, the, the naysayers, that's all right. I just take the ramifications from following Jesus. I don't hold it against them. 
and I'm, I'm, we're living in a culture where a lot of human beings are even screwed up between what they are and how they operate. So our job is to love them. I don't hate them. I reach out to them. I point them to Jesus, and I wait till the next one. And it's been ongoing, literally, ever since I was 28. So I'll be doing this as long as I'm able. And when I'm done here on the earth, out I go. Well, and Phil, I think it's it's important as well. You've kept your message simple. And, and you say that a lot in your presentation. I remember last year when I was here, when we were going through Romans 1, which you just read from, I read this Malcolm Muggeridge quote, which is, until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having educated himself into imbecility and polluted and drugged himself into stupefaction, he keeled over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and became extinct. We have so many people that are, <clears throat> because me, I'm drawn to these philosophies and I want to study the Kalam cosmological argument. I want to study, study, you know, teleology and eschatology and different views on, on this and that and amillennialism versus postmillennialism. And all, I think all that's great, but sometimes for Christians and non-Christians, you, you lose the thread of, well, what does the gospel say? And it's not quite so complicated. Yep. So look, here's Jesus and he's going to give us a marching order. And here's what he says. Just after you get the book of Matthew, God hasn't said a word to the human race for 400 years. You can read about in uh, chapter 27, right at the end of Matthew, the crucifixion. The death of Jesus is the next statement. The burial of Jesus. The resurrection. Just after the resurrection, here's what Jesus said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth is a lot of authority. <laughs> yep. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's what I do. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what I do. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, Jesus is talking. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So my task, Romans chapter 12, is a list of different ways we can serve God. Well, in that context, my job is to preach the gospel until they put me in the grave. So let's talk a little bit more about that, because you mentioned earlier, and I love the way you put it, you know, it's the last two pages of every gospel. So earlier this year, you and I had a phone conversation before I went out and spoke before the prisoners at Lewisburg Prison in Pennsylvania. And I know that you had done a lot of, you know, you had spoken to prisons and I think you were at Angola yep. and, you know, I, I knew from reading in, in one of your books, I can't remember which one, but how you talked about to these men, like, Hey, you can be under lock and key, but you can still be free. And I was feeling the weight of that speech, Phil, cause it's like, I didn't know what it was, but it was just, it was just different than going to speak at a men's event or at some, some church or some, you know, luncheon. And so you and I talked, talked on the phone. You gave me some really good advice. It was basically along the lines of this conversation, which is, hey, just keep it simple. It's the gospel message, just whatever. So I want to, I haven't talked to you since then, so I wanted to kind of give you an update as to as to what happened there. So I go out there and, um, you know, I spoke to, to a men's event, but then I also did two speeches at the prison. One of them was inside the walls and, you know, I'm interacting with murderers, rapists, pedophiles. Uh, burglars, armed robbers, like <clears throat> the worst of the worst. A lot of these men, they don't have the death penalty in Pennsylvania. A Surrounded lot of these, by iron. Right. <clears throat> and a lot of these men will never get out. That's like right. they, they will die inside of Lewisburg prison. And again, I'm walking around the, the, the different, the, the cell block and I'm just kind of out there. And it was funny because later I was like, man, I was in some compromising positions, but it's like, imagine if that was the way I went out, you know, getting killed in a prison where I was sharing the gospel with people. It's like, there are worse ways to go out. So, <clears throat> As I'm going through the cell block, I walk past one uh, cell and there were three men inside the cell that were uh, dressed as women, right? So they had makeup, long hair, and they were presenting themselves as women. And without getting too crass, um, they were doing things to remain alive inside of prison and to, you know, I guess thrive inside of prison by using their bodies. And we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So we get to the presentation 
and you don't have to go to the presentation. It's just something you could do. Yep. And so the, this place fills up. It's a gorgeous place, Lewisburg Prison. And one of the guys, one of the guys that dressed up, you know, as a, as a tranny, he was there. And there's a part of my speech where I talk about what it means to be a man. And I'm like, a man is a male that cultivates spiritual, mental, and physical resilience daily. And then I even say, and I looked right at him, I feel that it's kind of crazy. I have to say a man is a male as the beginning of my definition, right? And then I go through, um, and I'll, I'll get back to that particular guy here in a second. But my big thing is I go to the last two pages of Luke, Phil, and I talk about, and I read this to the guys, talk about Pilate delivering Jesus to be crucified. I talk about the crucifixion. I talk about the death of Jesus. I talk about him being buried. And then I talk about the resurrection. But I left a section out for these men. And whenever I went back and I did this for, for effect, and I, I think it, it had the desired effect. And one thing, just as a side note, I always feel the pressure when I'm going to speak somewhere because I'm, I'm really type A. I want to you know hit all my points and, oh, I'm going to be so smart and funny and like, you know, that kind of thing. This was the first time in my professional speaking career where I was like, I'm just going to open up my face and God's, you know, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to have my notes and I'm going to be well prepared. But, you know, this is up to the Holy Spirit, whatever he's going to do. So you I go were, back. You were called to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you helped remind me of that when we talked on the phone. But I go back to uh, Luke 23. And then I read starting in verse 39 through 42. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And I looked at these men and I set it up with some other things that is not important for our, our discussion. And I looked at these men. And I said, some of you are never going to leave here. You will die here. Some of you will leave here after having spent decades paying off, paying your penance to the people of Pennsylvania or wherever you did your crimes. Yep. And then I just looked at him. And I said, but even though you are under lock and key, you can still be free. You can be more free than the men that are walking around outside of this place. And so that day, about three dozen men uh, made a public declaration for their faith in Christ. And it was just, it was overwhelming, Phil. Like, I wish there was a baptismal there, but like, I mean, they've, they spent the next several weeks, you know, figuring out what these guys are going to do in their ministry and, you know, getting them baptized and all that. So I've watched the power of it for oh, 50 years. It, well, and it's, it's crazy because I got to see the ripple effect that you've been seeing for so long. And it's, it's kind of like a drug where it's just like you're, yep. you want to get that feeling again, but it's not for your aggrandizement, but it's for God's glory. And so one of the best, most incredible, impactful moments in my life, I was so thankful for, to have your help to kind of just get my mindset and my mind right before I went out there. Well, about two weeks ago, before coming out here to see you, I get a package in the mail that says, do not bend on it. I was like, okay, what is this? So I rip it open and there's a, I'll show a picture of it to you afterwards. Um, there's a, you know, a canvas about this big and it's a, you know, pencil drawing of praying hands with a crown of thorns around the edge. Really well done. And then I turn it over to the back and it's a bunch of notes from the prisoners that I spoke in front of at Lewisburg prison in Pennsylvania. And most of it was well wishes. They're praying for me and, and my voice and my throat because of, you know, my multiple throat surgeries and, you know, praying for he complete healing and all those things. And then the chaplain reaches out to me and says, hey, did, did you get that, you know, thing in the mail yet? And I'm like, yeah, I did. He goes, you get you want to know who drew that? It was that guy who was dressed up as a woman who came to my speech, made a public direct declaration of faith in Christ. He said from that day, he has not worn makeup. He cut his hair. He's coming to chapel like he is completely changed. And again, I say this in all humility. The power of God. It is the power of God, but in not, there's, there's no but. It is the power of God. It's just a reminder to me that that's not me. I didn't do that. Like he got me something and drew me something and gave it to me as a gift, which is a tremendous blessing that I will cherish forever. But all I did, Phil, was go in there and open my mouth and say what the book says. Just remember, you have been chosen as a ambassador mm. for Jesus. Our job is to preach the gospel. We love them. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. 
Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So as you go forward, my man, just remember that text right there, 1 Corinthians 13, because it's the hardest thing for people to do is to love God and love their neighbor. All one is asked to be done here by God is to love him and to love your neighbor. How hard could it be? Right. It's, it's not, a, you, you saw a man change. Now the love of God is in his heart. And that's why when you see that, you're seeing the power of God at work. But you wouldn't think so from some old scraggly looking character like me or you, my man. No offense. <laughs> I don't take any offense to it. I'm, I'm glad your voice is back. What you do is use it judiciously, but never back off, stand back. Or just go ahead and preach the gospel. That's our, that's our job. And when we find that six-foot hole, it's just a temporary stay until we're out of here alive. It is the greatest story ever told. Well, Phil, let's let's actually wrap with this. Um, there are a lot of people that, that listen to, to your show and also to my show, and there are people that are, I don't know if it's better to say that they're on the fence or they're at the precipice of faith. And there's something that, that's holding them back, and it could be a myriad of reasons. Maybe they look at Christians and, ah, oh, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Or maybe it's their own depravity and they can't see how God could possibly save a sinner as wretched as them. So if you would, in your way, as a simple guy with a scraggly beard, how about you lay out the gospel for our audience and give them an inv invitation? Mankind, they're, they're, they've sinned. The whole of mankind has sinned and they're going to physically die. Our job is to go forth, tell them about Jesus, that he loves them, that he, will, he has forgiven their sins by his death. He shed blood. The blood of God was what our sins cost Jesus. He willingly did that. They buried him. They're going to bury us. Three days later, he was resurrected. When that's told to a human being and they say, I believe it, I believe it, there's a way out of here. I said, it's the only way out of here. Think about a world where there is no way medically to beat death itself. There's a six-foot hole waiting on all of us. You say, one way out, Jesus, the Son of God. It took his death on a cross, and the blood. They buried him. They're going to bury us. He was resurrected. He said, you want this action or, or what? So it's not hard to understand at all. It's the truth that sets people free from sin and from death. So when they put their faith in Jesus, they're baptized in water, they're buried it's Jesus saying, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. So that's what my job and your job is. We just present the gospel, and whether they obey it or not, the next time we see them, we present it again and again and again. The worst it's been for us, which we're mo very fortunate, is that we're not killed early in the process. All these people you read about, all of the ones that Jesus sent forth, every one of them but one yeah. died, were, were killed over this. So we actually, you and myself and others like us, that we'll help make as soldiers in a battle, we'll go out and we have the message, the same message they had all these years before. It's the only way out. It is good news, the gospel. That's what it means, good news. So 
We're not going to back up, back down, or back off. We're just not going to do it. We love our neighbor, and we're going to tell them. If they curse us, we just smile and go on to the next one. So to the Christians in our audience, let that be an encouragement to you to never take your foot off the gas of spreading the gospel. And to the non-believers out there, this is this is us imploring you. You have to make a decision at some point. You have to put your stake in the ground. It's either Christ or yourself. Because as we go back even to Romans 1, Romans 1 is basically God saying, okay, you can be God. And that's, that's why they call this little bunch we've got here the unashamed you know, we're not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation for everyone, Jew or Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness is revealed. It's how to get out of here and live forever. So you read these texts. I'm fired up about it. I'm glad. I look back to when I was 28. They didn't actually ask me would I do the movie. They just said they're going to do the movie. But I want everyone to remember, it was not my idea to put my sorry hide on <laughs> the way I don't even own a cell phone, so I can't look at what they're looking at. And they said, we're going to put you on, you know, first on the big screen. And I'm like, go ahead on. I said, if we can convert one because of the movie, I said, I'll take it. Well, I think that if we can convert a hundred. I really can take it. Yeah, I think there will be a lot of people that will be saved by this. And I know and you're a humble guy and you're not big on compliments, but you are, have been an inspiration literally to millions of believers. You've hey. helped convert a bunch of people. You're an inspiration to a guy like me that's just trying to follow after the Lord in my own way. And I mean, you're a rock through which a lot of ministries. Can I was a commercial on. fisherman and we survived. I'd catch the fish out here in the river and sell them. And I told my woman, I said, I'm going to catch these fish, and we're going to sell them, and we'll survive. We won't have a lot of money, but we'll make it. I said, while I'm doing that, I'm going to figure out how much it costs me to go into business and build my duck calls because I have this thing about listening to birds, and I listen to what they, their sounds they're making. Pintails make one duck sound. Mallards are another with teal sounds like ball paint right here, different ones. So I figured out how to sound like birds. Well, who would have thought that would go out? And I ended up a millionaire <laughs> by building little devices that sound like birds. So I look at it, I said, the Almighty has been with me. He, he has, I never dreamed. He's I shown you be, favor. The first year, you know, we, we grossed about $8,000. I said, Miss Kay, we're on our way. And she said, we're going to starve to death. I said, no, we're not. So then the second year was, th was 13, five. Then it was 22 gross sales. Then about 40 gross sales. It hit a, the 100,000 mark. We were just shocked. Everybody running in every direction. So I just looked up one day on top of it all and was blessed beyond my, I never dreamed blessings would come from heaven itself. But I just kept preaching the gospel. Kept preaching the gospel. And the more I preached, the more duck calls we sold. So I just looked up one day. I said, thank you, Lord. I'm not going to stop telling everybody I can about you. So now if you lined them all up from the place down in the river, I tell them now, I said, listen, you can go to a nice warm pool of water and there are no alligators or cotton mouths. Down on the river, there's both. I said, but so far, no one's been bitten by a cottonmouth or inhaled by an alligator. But the waters are safer up here in the city. It's kind of like that old boy, that, uh, that one of them movies. You know, he said, you know, you need a mountain artist. Go out there, get out of these mountains, Jeremiah Johnson, and get down there and go to, go to a town, you know. He said, I've already been to a town. So don't you think it's funny when people go back? and think that you shouldn't have been, hey, they thought you were crazy for not playing football anymore. Yeah. And look at the life that you've been able to build in the ministry yeah. that you've been able to build as well. As it turned out, I ended up being an ambassador for Jesus, which to me that is, I mean, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So we all are. But so we just need to tell folks, you know, no matter what shape they're in now, there's better days ahead if you just accept Jesus by faith. 
die to see and get get it behind you, get it in your rear view mirror, and your life will be so much better. The ones that make the cut and come to see me years later, they say, you remember me? And I'm like, they go back 20 years, mm. 30, 40, and I don't, I can't remember them all, their names and all their adventures. I just go forward. The Almighty knows who they are. So it's the fuel that keeps me out there. Loving God and loving your neighbor, as it turns out, is pretty tough, but well worth it. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Look what he's done for us. We get out of here alive. I mean, this thing, is it's a serious thing. It's quite the deal. Yeah, we can get out of here alive. One thing for you, Phil, Phil, is you've got you've got a lot of a lot of gas left in the tank, and you got a lot more gospel left to spread. I'm just happy that you've taken a little bit of time to to spread with us, and I just wanted to thank you to your face again for helping get me set up for those men at that prison. And that's something I wish we'll you doing. well. I wish you that God will put His hand, and He has on you, as you march forward. We in this thing together, brothers. All right, thanks, Phil. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Phil Robertson. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the only link I've got for you today is a link to the Blind website. So if you need to find a theater near you that is showing it and buy tickets for you, buy tickets for your group, for your church, whatever, you can go and check it out there. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song, Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>